Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Advancing Biomedical Science, Live Cell Imaging of Vesicle Trafficking Using Perfectly Balanced Super Resolution Dragonfly Microscopy. I'm Christy Jewell of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Andor. For more information on our sponsor, please visit andor.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that today's event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, use that Ask a Question box to let us know you're experiencing a problem. Today's webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. At the end of the presentation, please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Kazuaki Yoshioka, staff researcher at the Department of Physiology, Kanazawa University Graduate School of Medical Science in Japan. Also joining us is Meredith Price, product and business manager at Amaris, and Dr. Claudia Florindo, Product Specialist, Life Sciences at Andor. For complete biographies on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Yoshioka, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, so thank you for giving me the wonderful opportunity to make this webinar. So I would like to introduce uh, recent my imaging data by uh, Andor Dragonfly. So let me uh, have some introduction first. So the membrane trafficking, including uh, endocytosis and exocytic pathways, are recently well studied but using conventional point scanning confocal microscopy. Uh, we had difficulty imaging the fast moving intercellular vesicles, such like clustering coated vesicles, endosomes, and lysosomes, with size of the less than a few hundred nanometers. So, this time lapse moving, movie of endosome trafficking has been taken by our Yokogawa CSU based Confoca microscope almost 10 years ago. So it looks not so bad. However, it's still not enough. So from now, I will show you our recent imaging data using uh, under Dragonfly microscope. So Dragonfly has very nice feature. You know, there are mainly four reasons. Large color, high speed, high resolution, and longer time period. So before the, the actual data, uh, I just want to show you some background in ESD kinase family study. So first, Inoshita 3 kinase PSDK family has three classes, one, two, three. Uh, class one consists of four members, P110 alpha, P110 beta, delta, and gamma. On the other hand, there are three class two ice form, it's alpha, beta, gamma, in addition to the single class three BP34. So we have been focusing on physiological role of class two PSVK in endocytosis because uh, PSVK sheets alpha has a class three binding domain in N terminal region. So class one PSVK produce PI three four five P three. It's called PIP three at plasma membrane by receptor tyrosine kinase or G G protein couple receptor activation. So it activates AKT to regulate wide variety of cellular function, proliferation, apoptosis, migration, and so on. And class three PSVK BK34 is now famous uh, because uh, we 
Exhibit 34 induces autophagy by starvation. So our group discovered that class 2 PA3K produce PA3P or PA3P2 on the, on the plasma membrane to control clustering dependent endocytosis. So now we understand the class 2 PA3K has very important function the membrane trafficking control to regulate many cellular function. So we made knockout mice. Then we found that unexpectedly, sheet uh, alpha global KO mice caused embolic lethality. This photo is a uh, full mount anti CD satin staining. This is EC marker of E11.5 uh, embryo. So you can see the uh, nicely, you know, uh, blood vessel formation in wild type. But in knockout mice, the, the, the vascular defect was found, severe defect in vascular formation, suggesting a, a non redundant role of sheets alpha. So this movie showing the GFP tandem 5 domain live imaging. So this is a PI3P specific probe. So now you can see the dynamic movement of RA and so on. So this indicate that uh, uh, we was impressed in, with this movie. Uh, sheet alpha knockdown cells showed the severe defect of endosomal trafficking in knockdown cells. Then I check the next. I check the uh, the involvement of sheet alpha in receptor endocytosis. So. This slide shows the immunostaining of anti phospho VEGF receptor 2 and EEA1. This is early endosome marker. So now you can see the uh, early endosome in red color without VGF stimulation in both cells. So VGF is a very important critical growth factor for endothelial cell function. So after VGF stimulation, uh, two minutes, uh, you can see nicely uh, activation of VGF R2 receptor in both cells. After 30 minutes, the host of VGF R2 signals were detected in EEA1, a positive early endosome in control cells, but not in CTFR knockdown cells to indicate that sheet alpha depletion impairs the endocytosis of activated VGFR2 receptor. And to monitor the precise subcellular localization of PSUK sheet alpha, we utilize new tools under Dragonfly. So this video showing self-screen super resolution imaging of a single live cell double transect with GFP sheet alpha and MRFP clustering. So from magnified view here, you can clearly see C2 alpha positive dynamic vesicle formation that were mostly co-localized with uh, RFP clustering in only short time period. So this panel shows uh, serial images of the recruitment of GFP C2 alpha to uh, the clustering, uh, uh, clustering the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, it, so you can see clearly see it's a positive dynamic basic formation uh, co localized with uh, clustering formation. So, but sheets are for recruitment is a little delay. So, let me summarize briefly what we have found. So sheet alpha is localized mainly to clustering coated pit or clustering coated vesicle, which produce um, PI3P 
2 at plasma membrane or PI3P on RN song to facilitate endocytosis. So we found that sheet alpha is essential for classically mediated endocytosis of VGFR2 and also uh, S1P1 receptor, this is G protein couple receptor, and subsequently endosomal small G protein low A and dark one activation on RN songs to control angiogenesis. So in addition, uh, we also published that the, the serine threonin kinase type of receptor, TGF beta receptor LK5, also depends on sheets alpha. So uh, I skipped some data. Then uh, as our next challenge in PSK study, the question is what's the difference between sheets alpha sheets beta isomes? So here I will show you in beta study using dragonfly microscope. So here is a semantic structure of three isomes of class two PSK. Sheet alpha has class 3 binding domain in N terminal region, but sheet alpha does not. Instead, has unique uh, domain, it's called proline rich region in N -term terminus. Then we try to emphasize the possibility that sheet alpha and sheet beta has distinct mechanism to control the endocytosis. To study this point, we utilize uh, pinocytosis model. Pinocytosis is one of the endocytic processes. Cells engulf uh, extracellular fluid and solutes by mainly two routes, a class three mediated or non-mediated. So first we examine the involvement of PSDK ice homes in pinocytosis using uh, FITC dextran uptake assay. So each specific SRNA knockdown efficiently uh, knockdown their respective proteins. So knockdown, knockdown of each is a sheet alpha or sheet beta significantly induced uh, reduced FITC dextran uptake compared with scramble control SRNA. So interestingly, uh, knockdown of class 1, T1, T alpha, or VPS34 did not. And again, and also we did double knockdown of sheets alpha, sheets beta. So interestingly, double knockdown showed no longer further inhibition, suggesting that uh, both alpha and beta are acting around the same pathway of pancytosis. Then I try to uh, Examine the subcellular localization of GFP tagged sheets alpha and M cherry tagged sheets beta in same cells by and or dragonfly. So GFP sheets alpha was distributed as a punctate pattern widely through the cells. The M cherry sheets beta was seen as restricted, I mean, the perinuclear punctate pattern and also find, found in the plasma membrane. So interesting, by using the super resolution uh, self strip mode, so GFP, GFP sheets, are, sheets alpha was found in packed pattern, this green color, whereas she, M cherry sheets beta was found in mesh-like structure. So only a few overlapping of sheets alpha and beta was observed. Maybe this is a kind of classroom coated pit. The previous study already showed that both sheets alpha and sheets beta in cell migration and actin polymerization. We confirm that localization of GFP sheets alpha and MHL sheets beta with actin filament using phallogen staining in fixed cells. So M cherry sheets alpha, but not its alpha, was highly localized with F actin structures, including membrane ruffling and actin patches in the cell periphery. So 
this movie is live cell imaging of GFPC2 beta and f actin probe called life act uh, probe in uh, endothelial cells uh, using by dragonfly substrate mode. So magnified view here showing the dynamic actin structure of membrane ruffling and those are ruffling. So you can see actin filament formation with well co-localized with GFPC2 beta positive vesicle. So we next studied the alexa level dextra uptake in cells that expressed the RFP clustering and actin probe in green. So we found that some uh, portion of dextran signal it is showing purple. Uh, so dextran signal were associated with clustering and f actin. This evidence indicates that the pinocytic pit and the best group were clustering coated and f actin associated. Then we studied the role of sheets alpha and sheets beta in the formation of pinocytic heat and the best course associated f actin uh, active patches. The knockdown of either sheets alpha or sheets beta substantially inhibited the exon uptake here. The knockdown of double uh, ether sheets alpha beta also inhibited the uh, association of the f actin and clustering and also association of the extron and f actin in only C2 beta. So this panel is magnified view. The co-localization between actin patches and clustering were reduced in C2 beta deleted cells. So the, the co-localization between dextron and actin patches was also reduced in C2 beta depleted cells. So again, these findings indicate that sheet beta is required for the formation of clustering coated pit or clustering coated vesicle associated actin patches. So next question is how sheet beta recruit to clustering coated pits and facilitate actin patch formation at clustering coated structure. So what we found is that intersecting one is a multifunctional scaffold protein, which was originally found to be localized in the clustering coated pit. So intersection one can bind to C2 beta through the interaction between SH3 regions of intersection one and the proline rich region of C2 beta. And recent study was uh, also showed that the intersection one recruits uh, F bar protein in the clustering coat pit. Uh, to stimulate actin patch formation through N WASP. So N WASP is uh, uh, involved in actin polymerization step. Uh, this step is dependent on uh, LAC and CDC42. So let me summarize this last part. PSUK uh, sheets alpha and sheets beta are necessary for clustering mediated pinocytosis. PSUK sheets alpha is localized to clustering coated pits and vesicles, whereas sheets beta is mainly localized to clustering coated pit and vesicles associated with F-actin. So sheets beta facilitate the formation of actin patches at clustering coated structure. Intersection one is recruited, uh, required for the formation of clustering associated actin patches and the localization of sheets beta at actin patches. Besides sheets beta, sheets alpha also regulate uh, clustering coated pit formation by different mechanisms. So sheets alpha so produce PI3 for P2 at clustering coat pit and regulate sorting nexin 9 or up to 3 to regulate actin uh, 
polymerization and contraction, and scission of CCV by dynamic. So uh, we conclude that sheets alpha and sheets beta differentially regulate class in medi end cytosis. Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, I want to summarize my talk. So we fully realize that class two PI3K seems to be responsible to produce PI3P2 and PI3P in, in the endocytic vesicles and subsequently to regulate the class mediated endocytosis. Now we believe that class two PI3K regulate not only receptor endocytosis and also receptor signals on the endosomes called endosoma signaling. So now we now understand that three classes of PSDK family can be distinguished by their distinct serial functions. Class one PSDK regulate receptor mediated end signaling at the plasma membrane. Uh, class two uh, the regulate endocytosis and also endosoma signaling. Class three BK34 regulate autophagy in the autophagosome. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Yoshioka. Hi, everyone. My name is Meredith Price, and today I'm going to talk to you about Amaris and how you can use it for intracellular dynamics and the study of those and the analysis. Amaris is a 3D and 4D visualization and analysis software for microscopy images. And within Amaris, you're able to do a number of different types of analysis and to visualize your data sets, whether they're smaller confocal data sets or large light, light sheet images. And specifically for intracellular dynamics, you can study vesicles and organelles, their interactions with each other, or cytoskeletal and nuclear components and how they're moving over time um, within your images. And um, you're also able to even study things like mRNAs and, um, and specifically looking at, at them, like, like the Liang Zhang Yin paper that was just recently published uh, within Molecular Cell, where they used a CRISPR system to look at RNAs within living cells. And so you can see that down, uh, that an image from that paper uh, in this slide. And so there's a variety of different uh, types of questions you can ask and, and use Amaris and its analysis, specifically its tracking analysis, to better understand these dynamics that are happening within your cells. Specifically, the types of things Amaris can report for you and give you are um, not only to identify each spot uh, that you might see in your image, and, then, and in this case, we're looking at the ends of microtubules within a spindle um, from this paper from Yamashita, but you're also able to get that position over time. Amaris will calculate the speed, give you other motility measurements. Um, you can also get track links, its duration, the total displacement that you see per track, again, throughout your uh, movie. And even more importantly, you can start to understand how these objects that you're tracking, whether they are something like the tip of a microtubule or a vesicle or organelles, how they are interacting uh, with other objects in your images. And so, there's been work done using Amaris where uh, groups are looking at different types of organelles and how they are interact interacting with one another. So are they touching one another? Are they very close to one another? And how long do they maintain that, um, that connection or that interaction? And so one thing I do want to point out is that for all of the all of these types of results and the work that you do with an Amaris, you do need to make sure that you're paying attention to the constraints that um, you have on your imaging. So you have spatial and temporal res uh, resolution constraints while you're doing live cell imaging. Many of us know that. And I want to mention that during your imaging, if, 
if you have constraints on spatial or temporal resolution, this can affect your analysis. And so it's something to keep in mind as you're going into any analysis software, not just Demaris, but others as well, that having the best spatial resolution so that you can um, detect the objects that you're actually um, that you're actually wanting to analyze as well as making sure that you have high temporal resolution so that your tracking is as accurate as possible um, is, uh, is incredibly important. So optimizing your imaging for those two reasons um, is important, of course. Now, how do we get to that endpoint? I gave you a number of different examples of the measurements that are possible within Amaris from the um, time-lapse images that you're acquiring, but how do we get there? And so the first, um, the first thing that you would wanna do is to go and identify or segment all of the objects through time. Then you're able to go in and perform tracking. And then finally, once you have those tracks, you can, go, you can go into Amaris and do different types of analysis of those tracks as well as um, various types of reporting that are available. And so I'm gonna go through just a little bit more in detail to show you how that's done within Amaris. So what you're seeing now um, in the lower left-hand corner is how within Amaris we have creation wizards. And so we really try and take the um, user of Amaris through this process step by step to make it as easy as possible for you. So the first step, as I said, is to identify all of the objects within your image. And what I'm showing on the right-hand side is, in, um, is a mask cell from a plant cell where we're seeing um, the very tips of microtubules labeled with the protein EB3 that's been fused to a GFP. And you're seeing that those tips have been um, have been identified based on the parameters on the left-hand side, and um, each of those tips is, has, um, has been overlaid with a spot by Amaris. And so after we've done that, the next step is to go in and track those over time. And it, you can see that within Amaris, we ha I've used the autoregressive motion algorithm, but you're also able to use a variety of different tracking algorithms. It just depends on the type of um, the the type of motion that your spots have or your objects have, and you're able to put in some distance parameters as well. In addition, one thing that I've done here uh, within this analysis is I've placed what we call a reference frame into the center of the cell where the organizing uh, of the microtubules is happening. And so then that allows for later um, within the work uh, to analyze just how far away each of those spots that I've identified is from that center, um, uh, from that microtubule organizing center. So now, what types of analysis and reporting are available in Amaris? Once you've tracked your, uh, your objects within your cells, then you're able to go in and do different types of analysis and reporting. I'm gonna show you a video now. And this video is showing you how I've taken a specific cell and focus just on it, mask it out so I could focus just on it. Again, the EV3 spots at the end of the microtubules have been identified. You're seeing those color-coded by how far away they are from that reference frame that I've put right on top of the microtubule organizing center. So the, uh, the colors are matching the color bar that you see in the bottom right-hand corner, and um, you're also seeing the tracks over time associated with them. Just, uh, just the last few time points um, is what you're seeing. And so these animations can be made within Amaris and are a great way of showing your results and reporting those to others. Another way of reporting your results and, and showing that to others is of course to represent the numbers and to actually use the numbers. So within Amaris, we do give you many, many different measurements. As I mentioned before, there's a variety of measurements that we, will, we report. Those are found within the software and can also be exported out into Excel for you to work with outside of Amaris if you choose to. 
Another option for reporting your measurement uh, within Amaris is to use our Vantage View. And so what you're seeing here is a plot where I'm looking at displacement over time uh, for, each, uh, for each of the spots, for each of the tracks. And you can see that it's growing over time, as you expect. But any of the measurements that we make, you can also put within a plot like this. So you could be looking at shape differences over time. You could look at intensity changes over time. It could also help you find those interactions that I was speaking of before, where you're looking at the intensity of another channel over time. And you can see when two objects are touching one another. So it does give you this, this vantage view gives, gives you a nice quick way of seeing um, the, the results of your, of your analysis within Amaris without having to take it to another software. So today I hope I've shown you how you can use Amaris to analyze the intracellular dynamics, whether they be endosomes um, and looking at that sorting, looking at uh, vesicle movement or uh, objects that are, that are found at the tips of microtubules or even telomeres within the uh, within the nucleus. All of those things are possible within Amaris. Um, and you go through the, the different steps of Amaris within our creation wizard to then finally analyze and report those, uh, report those measurements. I would also like to mention before I leave everyone that Amaris, uh, the Amaris team has released a new Amaris viewer. This is a free software that you can find at amaris.com slash viewer. And it allows you to look at your raw data files. And so that could be the files coming off of a dragonfly microscope um, or uh, from a variety of other uh, uh, microscope manufacturers, as well as the Amaris files that you have analyzed already. And this can be, um, this can be placed on any computer that has the recommended specifications. You can find that information also at amaris.com slash viewer. And this is great to make sure that you can share your data with, um, with, with anyone um, as long as they have viewer as well. So we hope that this helps everyone uh, spread their work to others. And now I, what I want to do is open, uh, open it up to questions from everyone. There's a chat box or a question and answer box that you can type your questions into. They don't have to, uh, of course, not just questions for me, but also questions for uh, Dr. Yoshioka. Um, and then we'll be able to answer those for you. So thank you, everyone, for your attention, and I appreciate your time. Okay, just before we go through the questions, uh, Meredith, I just want to go through the Dragonfly, which is the system that Dr. Yoshioka used to do to get his wonderful data that he just presented. So Dragonfly is Andor multimodal confocal imaging system. It is a high contrast multimodal platform. And why is it a multimodal platform? It is a multimodal platform because it allows you to do confocal imaging, and it is a, an instant confocal. It also allows you other imaging modalities, such as laser wild field imaging, surf, and even super resolution with this storm or surf stream. You can use the Dragonfly with a very broad range of wavelengths from the visible to the near infrared. And it has a very flat illumination across the whole field of view because we use Andor's patent Borealis illumination uh, system. So because it is a multipoint confocal, you can see it immediately in the imaging here on the top. It has very fast image acquisition when compared to point scanning confocals. The faster acquisition will obviously increase your temporal resolution. Also, Dragonfly is a dual spinning disk lens system, and therefore it will allow you higher efficiency in the capture of light. It is therefore less phototoxic, and combined it with the SCMOS and the MCCD's ultra-sensitive detectors, you will be able to capture more photons and will cause less phototoxicity and less photo bleaching to your samples, leading to less sample damage and better live, better and longer live imaging. 
I would just want to talk briefly about the surf stream, which is a technique that, as you just seen, Dr. Yoshioka used a lot in his uh, research. And this is a, an image from a movie that Dr. Yoshioka just presented with surf stream. Surf stream will yield an increase in resolution when compared with the diffraction limit of light between two to six times more. And the low power requirements used for surf stream make it compatible with live cell imaging. So Andor's surf stream algorithm allow you to acquire images that break the diffraction limit of light at a frame rate as fast as 10 frames per second. So the Dragonfly comes in two models, the Dragonfly 500, the full complete solution, and the more compact solution offered either as an inverted microscope or an upright microscope, the Dragonfly 200. There is much more to talk to you about the Dragonfly, but due to time constraints, I will now stop for questions. I'll be happy to take any questions on the system, and I'm sure that Dr. Yoshioka and Meredith are also very happy to take questions about the science and how to analyze your data. We are very thank you for you attending to our webinar and I hand it over to you, Christy. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you, Meredith and Dr. Yoshioka for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, Dr. Yoshioka, let's begin with you. What is your next challenge in PI3 kinesis study? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, so actually, we are planning to uh, both in vivo and in vitro study. So today, I skipped many data about in vivo knockout mice study. So actually, we have uh, many knockout mice of PSUK kinase, sheets alpha, beta, and also and, uh, so counter partner against PSUK in you know, phosphatase. Uh, now we're planning to study in vitro knockout mice study to show the uh, in, you know, significant and functional significance of plus two PSUK in vivo. And also in vitro study, we are now planning to uh, the show the, the, the flat imaging uh, by Andor Dragonfly uh, surface stream microscope. So we already published several paper about uh, endosomal signaling uh, threat study, but uh, I want to try to, uh, again, to show more the high resolution and distribution of activated site in the endosomes. So that's our, my, you know, the, you know the next challenge. Is that okay? It is, thank you. Now, Claudia, let's come over to you. This question has come in for you. Is it possible to use photo manipulation tools with the dragonfly? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, it is possible. And we at Andor also supply photo manipulation tools. Uh, we supply mosaic and micropoint. Just briefly, micropoint allows single point illumination and you can use it for high laser power applications such as ablation and DNA damage. And Mosaic, it's a device more suitable for optogenetics. It's extremely fast and allows simultaneous multipoint illumination of very complex regions. Thank you, Please Claudia. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and Dr. Yoshioka, this next one is for you. Do you know why PI3KC2-beta was shown to be required for the actin at Clathrin coded structures. Yes, that's also a good point. So we already found uh, uh, intersection is a key player to regulate sheets of beta recruitment to the actin patches and uh, clathrin coated structure. 
So, but uh, we still have in, not enough data about that relationship between intersection one and SIPS beta. So we will start to study about more precise mechanisms of SIPS beta regulation on intersection one. So maybe we have to test the possibility that uh, small G protein, LAC and CDC42, how regulate those complex formation and regulate actin polymerization. So that's key mechanism to understand the full story of clustering uh, mediated endocytosis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yoshioka. Okay, Claudia, and back to you again. Can you combine surf with turf using the dragonfly? Yes, you can. And in fact, you can combine SERF with any imaging modality in the dragonfly, uh, wide field, uh, confocal, or turf, or, or turf, sorry. Being the fact uh, that SERF will allow you, uh, when combined with the confocal, super resolution deep inside your sample on the confocal mode, or increase your turf resolution up to 50 nanometers in XY at the edge of the cell membrane, at the cell membrane surface. So uh, SERF can be combined with any imaging modality and will increase your resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Now, Dr. Yoshioka, while we're talking about SERF, why was imaging with SERF important to obtain your results? Okay, so actually, we have suffered from low resolution and low sensitivity of our conventional convoca microscopy. So new tool, Dragonfly, helped us with those ish all issues. So when we try to determine the subcellular localization of our interest within a cell, Dragonfly allows us to perform the multi color, you know, a blue, green, red, and far red, four colors and also 3D imaging with uh, continuously high-resolution confocal wide mode, very wide view mode, and also super-resolution surf stream mode in the same sample. So I can say that this feature is absolutely amazing. So, and I was impressed with Dragonfly surf stream imaging that can provide us with perfect balance of resolution and speed. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Now, Claudia, what is the maximum speed that you can acquire with a dragonfly? So, uh, with a dragonfly, as I just said before, it's a multimodal imaging platform. So, you have different speeds considering the different imaging modalities that you are using. So, if you use it in the confocal mode, you can go as fast as 400 frames per second. If you want to go even faster, you can use the wild field mode, and then you can acquire up to 1,600 frames per second. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we're almost out of time. So let's hop to this final question. And Dr. Yoshioka, let's have you answer this one. What are the main challenges that you need to overcome to do your imaging? Yes, uh, so we already have a uh, you know, dragonfly, then now we can perfectly examine the localization of the, our interest. But now we are further planning to perform uh, threat imaging to see the, the activation site of the many signaling molecules. I uh, already said, like a low lag lab activation by using dragonfly surf stream super resolution microscopy. So as a goal of our project, we have to identify the physiological significance of all class 2 PSDK isoforms to understand the entire PSDK family. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yoshioka. Now, before we go, I would like to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the email address you provided at the time of registration. 
I'd also like to thank Dr. Kazuaki Yoshioka, Dr. Claudia Florindo, and Meredith Price for their time today and for their important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Andor, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and we thank you for joining us. Have a great day.